about the uh, types of semantics from chapter two. And uh, let me just uh, recap uh, the first slide. I just completed. <coughs> so we are talking about three types of semantics. One is uh, implicit, uh, powerful, and form. So let's try to understand uh, what these things, are, what these three means. So as I explained in last time, uh, think about this as a, a RDF data graph, where all these blue nodes are entities, and uh, these are literals, this the values. Uh, at we in RDF we use uh, URL to represent any kind of entity, uh, just to give a unique ID. Basically, what here is saying is something has relationship one other thing with name relationship directional, and the name is likes. Like that. Same thing has another relationship called type, and the value is graduate. So even though it's uh, it doesn't tell you much, but you can still you can infer some stuff, saying that these two entities might be uh, representing something similar because both has same type of URL uh, pattern and then uh, both has uh, links, outgoing, outgoing links, name, likes and uh, typos. So this is what we, uh, here we are using implicit semantics, namely the URL pattern and the outgoing links uh, with same label. And we might be able to cluster these two things like saying this might be uh, similar things. So that is uh, the that is where we use implicit semantics. So what is uh, other types? Powerful and uh, uh, formal. Let's get to formal first. Mm, the, uh, here we are adding little more semantics into the this data set, saying that. These two entities are of type student. This is what we call classes, and this is what we call individuals. Basically, if you are familiar with the, the programming world, this is class, and this is instance of that class. And we are in middle more semantics, saying that student is a subclass of person. We are in the uh, little more semantics, and these terms, like RDFS, subclass of, these are well-defined terms, and Everybody know how to interpret these things. Like in Java, you know, if you tell a saying that class or the term for, while, anywhere in the world, you know how to interpret those things, right? So same thing here. People have defined the semantics for RDF type, RDFS subclass of, and this owl equivalent class. Those are keywords. Uh, we, here, uh, here we are saying particular thing, actually a course equivalent to a class from some other schema. Uh, by saying that what I get is, since these two are individuals of course, now I can say these two are individuals of class as well, because that's the, the same. Here I can say uh, these two are explicitly student, and because it's student is a subclass of person, these two are person as so this, this is the formal part. So what is powerful here? Uh, this individual has two outgoing links, named with likes and two other entities, but it doesn't say much about uh, uh, the, uh, which course he most likes. In real world, what you find is a lot of this kind of relationship, not uh, these things. It's very difficult to find uh, domains that you need to model, and you can model that domain with only these things. Uh, yeah, the, the, so the reason it might be fuzzy is right, because when you say like, let's say on Facebook, well, what is the context in which you like? And um, if for the reader, it might be uh, somewhat easier to make, you know, interpret, to interpret 
based on the context. <coughs> but uh, uh, just like <coughs> the machines, that something you, you like, two likes may not be equivalent. Uh, you know, and they may be liking things for different reasons. And um, somebody has a, let's say, po pose a um, very, um, uh, 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 so somebody posts criticism of something, and somebody says likes. He likes the fact that he posted criticism, uh, uh, or uh, because the person posted criticism, is that what he's like? Or he likes the criticism itself? Uh, and there are many potential nuances as to what a particular relationship means, right? So I think that is, that is an aspect that is uh, unclear and fuzzy in particular. And plus, the degree of relatedness can always vary. So that is another very major issue. Technically, it is not the issue like that. It is not that you cannot represent uh, different degrees. So since uh, last time Reed asked this question, I included one slide here. So technically, in whatever, uh, in our world, you can represent such things. <coughs> like these people is talking about somebody like something, and you can say with degree something. So you can say he likes this, then that. So technically, you can do, this is called uh, verification, where you describe uh, triples for the furthermore. But the thing is, these things is capturing such knowledge is the problem, which are very subjective as uh, Dr. just described. Just to give a uh, summary, uh, implicit, uh, what we mean by implicit semantics is, is we try to exploit statistical properties and patterns from data and uh, try to do something like clustering, classification. Those are the typical uh, algorithms where they use implicit semantics of data sets. Foreman, um, they have, like, like I said, they have a properly defined semantics, what you say, model theory semantics. And uh, since they can, whatever you say, like RDF subclass is the same thing anywhere in the world you can write generic reasons so that people can generate more knowledge using such uh, representations. These are two dominating languages, RVFS and OWL, where yeah, they have good uh, constructs to uh, develop such algorithms. And powerful, mm, here we are talking about we are dealing with fuzzy things, inconsistent, partial truth, those kind of things. And uh, people have worked on possibilistic, probabilistic, and fuzzy reasoners to deal with such uh, representations. But uh, always the outcome of such a uh, algorithm has a, it's not always 100% You have a, uh, you have to deal with that. Yes. Why is that considered powerful if it's not always correct? Powerful in, a ter in terms of you can represent rich Semantics. Yeah, the specimens. Uh, with formal and with formal, you cannot say degree, right? That should be either true or false. Yeah. But here we are talking about degree of true and degree of false. That's why it's uh, interpreted as, as powerful. Okay. So from here on. Research type of projects. Uh, I use a uh, recovering structure of RDF graph, which is the research of uh, Sarasi. She used implicit semantics there. And this is a formalizing perception, perception cycle, which is <coughs> again uh, uh, research at Noises, uh, one of my senior students, Cory Hansen. And this is what I am working on. We are trying to exploit the semantics to enhance NLP algorithms. We are basically trying to use, trying to integrate some powerful semantics into the, our representation. Okay. So uh, there is something called link open data. They are just where people just put their data sets without good schema <coughs> or shallow schema. doing these kind of applications. Query processing, federated query, query uh, question answering, and data sharing and all those things. But just having a data set doesn't, you cannot do it efficiently. You have to describe this data set a little more so that people can understand what you are trying to interpret. 
market values. So those are the kind of uh, four I think she used a little more, but I just uh, kept the list four uh, implicit semantics from the data set. This is 
observe that because that doesn't tell him to do anything. But family is key, right? If it is the case, then he can uh, infer that. So this is the, the formal way of represent his representation about this knowledge. Um, this is not that the, the complete thing. I just um, uh, mentioned here three things only. So explanation, explanatory feature is a uh, feature that can explain your observation. Like the, when you, you observe palpitation, these two are two candidates for explanatory feature because you can explain palpitation by these two. And expected is, if you find this, that these two are the features, you expect something to present like this because you have this, you should have some this, right? Discriminated discriminating property is the property that helps you to discriminate between the, the explanations. So whenever you have hypertension and hypothyroidism, Femi skin is the discriminating property. By get to that, by getting that you can get to hypothyroidism. So here he has formalized all these things. This is the reference for that paper. And now he can uh, do such interesting things in different domains. So he has applied by observing mean speed, temperature, those are the properties, and try to come up with the, the whether it's a blizzard or whatever it is. And uh, fire detecting robot, and we have applied that to knowledge acquisition in healthcare domain. And this is the running project uh, called K Health, Knowledge Enabled Health, and we then everybody works on that. So that is what you can do with formal scenarios. If you s capture such a scenario, and if, it, if that scenario is present in different domains, your algorithm is valid to each and every domain. That is why he was able to apply that to different domains. Uh, how many of you have taken a course in uh, logic uh, or formal rep knowledge representation? So not too many. So. Um, to some extent, I think we should recognize that things may not be totally clear to many of the Yes. Yeah. Hopefully, those examples help you to understand what I do. Okay. So now we are trying to get into powerful semantics, what actually it means and where it uh, uh, helps. Uh, think about, for some reason, Resolve this inconsistency. Okay. One one way to think about it is uh, think about think that imagine that you are a domain expert. You know what uh, what medications are prescribed to uh, these diseases and what. Okay. In that case, if you know that that this particular medication is prescribed to this only, not to uh, CHK, which is Heart 
much more strength than that one. So we are trying to, uh, so this is a, a such a, a, a knowledge base, saying that this particular medication is treated, uh, used to treat all these three, and this to treat all these two. But the problem is you cannot solve such a problem, the, the, the inter-sensory problem, with this cement, this knowledge base. You have to have this thing. Saying that uh, this has high strength with this disease rather than that. Right? So as if you return aspirin, aspirin may have low to every everything. If you have this knowledge, then you can do something. semantics, the degree of strengthness to resolve this particular problem. This is a very practical problem. Uh, still, it's not resolved. Okay, so given that, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, first thing, how do we came up to this situation, like in terms of strength? Oh, yeah, I, I just said, imagine that, right? I can explain the scenario, but uh, it's, uh, because actually, uh, these are coming from unstructured data, and they use some NLP algorithms to come to this level. But NLP algorithms sometimes do that. They cannot uh, represent, they cannot identify uh, negation. Okay. So, so, yeah. So when you represented this problem further using, uh, if, we go to, if we can go to the next slide, is that high and Formalizing this thing, right? As you shown in the formal semantic example. Yes. I so can. I mean, how is it different than that formal semantics? Again, we are. Just uh, yeah, but the thing is, this high, right? This <coughs> is subjective thing. This high can be different from high here to high somewhere, somewhere else, right? Because I, I, uh, if I have like uh, uh, a span of like one to ten, and this is eight. Then I'm kind of close. But just saying high, somebody can interpret as nine, somebody can interpret as ten. And this does not have proper interpretation, proper semantics. Okay, this is only valid in this domain only. So you can uh, formalize this further as uh, some values with one to ten that will um, you know really I mean Yes, but the thing is, still you are not going, still you are not capable of uh, doing what formal semantics does. It is very application. Mm. Very application specific, and you cannot write generic algorithms to such problems. Right? If you take about, if you take OWL or RDFS, if you write a piece of software that do some reasoning, it is applicable everywhere. try to uh, categorize uh, some applications into uh, these three different dimensions. Okay. I just try to uh, do this, uh, I may be wrong in some dots. Okay. Uh, I try to do my best to visualize this in three dimensional space, but uh, I don't know. Uh, this is, all these things are in this page. Implicit and formal only. Okay. Uh, these are uh, 
But if you talk about the modern Google search, where they use knowledge graph and Bing search, where they use this category theme, that kind of going towards trying to use formal semantics. And uh, uh, this is uh, Dr. Seth's uh, product, and the Tahi. It is also in that space because it uses background knowledge. Basically, use implicit and formal If you move to uh, data integration applications, where I denote them as RAID here, uh, whenever you integrate data, sometimes you use uh, like this description similar. Like, okay, first take the name similar. By just looking at the syntax, saying that. Uh, Birth date in one data set and birth date in another data set, you say the same type. We are using the same uh, uh, name similarity. Actual name similarity with such a case, it's implicit. But if you uh, represent that without same as, okay, then you are using form. That is why name similarity is in this way. Description similarity is some data is being described with uh, words, and you are trying to see whether <coughs> these, two, these two data points are same by using description, when, then you are trying to say how many common words are in this description. So we are using implicit similarities. And uh, type similarity is the, the, the class. saying that some person dead place is some city and again somewhere else it says uh, this person uh, disease place place something like that and then dead then these two places are same right you are describing the same thing he tries to align those properties where he use uh, implicit and formal because he uses our same as he try to exploit that our same as <coughs> Um, and uh, question and answering systems, Siri, it uses uh, background knowledge, ontologies, okay, as I said, <coughs> because those are the proprietary <coughs> things. And from the article that I got is uh, they are using uh, ontologies and other things. Watson again, uh, it uses all three. I, I'm trying to get Watson into powerful because they are calculating the decree, right? So it's relationship and try to come up with confidence with that. Then Even though those are not explicitly mentioned, they are on the fly calculating that. Think, yeah. Then how does it difference from the ranking in the ranking in there also we give some kind of confidence. But we don't know like whether they are using any other techniques than statistical. Ranking uh, we know what they are using, right? They are using that uh, how many uh, links come into the so page. Are in the case of bots. Uh, yeah. The Watson's ranking scheme is fairly sophisticated and complicated, right? Because they have many different. In fact, if you think about, and he has an interesting observation. If you think about some of the most uh, high. So, so Watson's uh, ranking uh, is challenging, you know, more, not more complicated than anything because, in fact, the beauty of uh, much of the power of Watson comes from actually uh, this layer ranking strategy. So they have a number of 
things coming in to help rank from among many possible things. It doesn't try to compute the perfect answer. It said uh, there are a lot of answers that are computed and then the best one is picked. And that strategy is very unique. Uh, that sets apart from very traditional things, including um, now, uh, I think um, uh, to some extent, uh, Sujan has just uh, meshed up uh, things and made the things complicated, but uh, it, to some extent, rightly so. But the issue is pretty challenging in terms of semantics. So uh, I had not myself uh, uh, put things like Tali and symmetrical association and other things on such a scale. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure I agree with, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with the exact positioning of all those things. But it's a very good attempt. Think about semantic associations. Uh, there, uh, it's a path. Uh, you have entity A and B, and it kind of looks for six degrees of separations, or any way you connect the dots, essentially between the dots, uh, between A and B. Um, and um, if you think about uh, the path itself, uh, there is a, a degree of specificity. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, that path is complete based on some graph graphical representation. Path is complete in a graph of RDF. And that's how the semantic uh, association or row operator is implemented. But when you think about that as a, a matter of, let's say, search, um, then a search in the sense of how A relates to B, then it is pretty complicated because you have all these points and there are many features or parameters that can be used to optimize the ranking of the results. Okay? So um, uh, that, that brings in, uh, you know, well, would I simply talk about the semantics as it's captured in individual path, or would I talk about the semantics as in uh, the entire process of finding the relevant uh, connection between A and B, which then includes uh, ranking aspects of it, and the ranking of path is fairly different than ranking of uh, some other text documents, very different than ranking of question answers as in uh, Watson, for example. So uh, there are many, many things that, you know, you can explore in this space here. And enough for that for now.
search in for Milky Way to uh, put all the relevant um, citation at the bottom of each individual slide, so not at the very end because I mean, there's no context and you have to give uh, the credit to the person who, you know, created the slide, for example, or the figure that you are using and everything like that, right there. So this doesn't open for certain slides, I did. Right, uh, you need to go back and correct. Yeah, so the rest of them, uh, the beginning of the slides, I'll do it at the end of this lecture. So um, before I begin with this presentation, I would like to uh, ask a question. So what is the goal of semantic web? What, what is, why are we doing this research in semantic web? And what is the end goal, as you people see it? So, It's not working right now, so um, the thing that I'm supposed to be demoing is not working right now, so I'll do it in the next class. We had an issue with one of the semantic modules, so uh, we do it for the sentiment module, so it's not working right now. Um, so going to the, uh, starting with the presentation, what is semantic annotation? What is annotation in general? What does the English word annotation mean? So adding metadata to any data, yeah. that's annotation. The act of adding this metadata to all the data available, that's uh, annotation. So you're adding, semantic annotation is to add semantics to the web, to all the data available on the web, to all the different types of data. We have structured, unstructured, we have all the social data, we have scientific journals, we have all of this humongous data out there. And adding metadata to this content, so it can be retrieved easily. That's uh, annotation. Now, for example, in this uh, this particular example, if you take a look at it, here it says uh, item property name and telephone and uh, the URL for this example, Joto and uh, whatever the telephone number, etc. So this information is annotation. But adding this metadata to that uh, information of the person is annotation. Why do we need annotations? So again, going back to why we need semantic web, what is the end goal of doing this research in semantic web? So machines can process the data on the web. As of now, we can humans can go and read text on the web, but can machines read the text just the way humans read? Can machines identify the context of a document? Can they do that now? We are doing, we are adding semantics, we are adding these annotations, we are adding the metadata to the data so machines can process data. Machines can interpret the resources just like humans do. So that's the goal of annotations. Different forms of data. So what kind of data is available on the web as of today? So you have, it can be categorized as unstructured, semi-structured, structured, and multimedia data. Now unstructured data is everything the grammatical, the one which follows the linguistic rules. So you have the scientific journals, you have articles in PubMed, newspaper articles, all of these are following the linguistic rules. These can be categorized under grammatical text. Then you have the user-generated content on the other end of the spectrum, which is all the social media data. So you have Facebook posts, you have tweets from Twitter, you have blog posts, all of that is the user-generated content. So why are we discussing different forms of data? We started 
started with the need for annotating data on the web. Now we are talking about different forms of data because we want to know all the kinds of data that we are going to annotate. So that's why we are talking about different forms of data. So we talked about unstructured data, categorized as grammatical text and user-generated content. Next is the semi-structured data. We are all familiar with it. XML and HTML documents containing uh, different tags which de describe the structure of the uh, document. Then you have structured data, which is relational database, RDF, triples, etc., which have a particular structure, which have a data model. And then the multimedia data. Everything else in the world, right? Everything else that's not categorized as unstructured, semi-structured, or structured falls under multimedia data. Your videos and images and photographs and everything. So here the point being, are we annotating only textual data? No. We want to annotate multimedia data also. We want to search multimedia data also. And in fact, searching multimedia data is a lot more difficult and complex than searching uh, other textual data because we can still use string matching and pattern matching and do all of that to search textual data and get fairly decent results as of today even without adding semantic annotations to it. But multimedia data is a whole different thing. For searching multimedia data, you need to attach metadata to the data to figure out what you have to search in multimedia data. So those are the different forms of uh, different types of data that we Next is, uh, how do we define semantic metadata? <coughs> I'll let you read that. Uh, metadata that describes contextually relevant or domain-specific information about content in the right context based on an industry-specific or enterprise-specific custom metadata model or ontology is known as semantic metadata. So, um, the aim here is to establish context. That's what cannot be done by just string matching or traditional uh, retrieval algorithms. So what we want to do is establish the context of a document. For example, if you have the name of a very famous politician, uh, this example is in fact taken from an article that Dr. Shirk had written, and it's the, uh, the reference that is there at the end of this uh, presentation. So if you have a famous politician mentioned in a docu uh, mentioned in a newspaper article which is talking about a business meeting and this business party or something of that sort where, where this politician was just the chief guest, the document is still not about the politician himself. It's about something else. So in that context, the politician is not relevant. So how do we establish the context of a document in such a scenario? So that's why we need semantic metadata associated with documents. Now, this is one of the examples. Uh, All right, so uh, this is uh, this slide describes the role of semantic metadata, essentially just describing everything we have talked about so far. We want to extract and organize and standardize information from disparate and heterogeneous sources. So we have all these different forms of data and we want to um, annotate all of this information there in different forms. And we want to extract relationships from the entities identified in these documents. We are trying to establish context here, which is more important. That's the significant part of doing the semantic annotations. And uh, we are trying to identify relationships which are not directly mentioned in a document, which by natural language processing we cannot infer from a document. For example, there is here is this example of a newspaper article which has been annotated by a software group. And you have all these uh, company names which have been annotated. You see HP and Home Depot and Microsoft and uh, Oracle here and PeopleSoft and so this tool identifies the uh, reference to the tool is again at the end of the presentation in the references section. So the point here is that this tool is able to annotate, is able to infer relationships in this text that Oracle is a competitor of all these other companies here. So inferring these kind of relationships, which you would not do, which you would not be able to infer in a traditional uh, NLP algorithm setup or something like that, that's the 
the goal of semantic uh, metadata and that's the goal of semantic annotations here. So that's what we are achieving here. Inferring relationships that you would not be able to uh, without annotating data like this. Now we talked about how uh, we want to do annotations not just for textual data but also for multimedia data. So here we are talking about uh, different types of images, videos, and uh, all of these data being annotated. So the semantic metadata for multimedia can be categorized roughly into these three types. Uh, the metadata can be either media type specific, that would be, you know, the examples here would be uh, font size of the text or the motion in the video of the images, something like that. The media processing specific metadata or the content specific metadata. The content would be now whether the video is talking about, I don't know, a politician's speech or whether the video is about a cricket match or the video is about a football game. So you define the metadata based on the content. That would be content specific metadata. Now, what would this metadata be useful for in the context of multimedia? It could be used for querying and retrieval, navigation, and browsing of all these different videos and images and everything. Now, um, another thing we have to remember here is the maintenance of metadata. So in what context would the metadata change? In what scenario would the metadata change? content changes, if I go and change an image, or if I go and change a video or some aspects of the video, would I have to change the metadata? Yes. And uh, say, let's talk about a scientific domain where certain documents are classified and you have created an ontology and everything. Say the latest research leads you to conclude that certain classifications are different. So even without the change in the content of the documents that you are talking about, the metadata would still change. Would you agree? Yeah? So the metadata is going to change, will change whether or not the actual content changes. So that's that's one aspect that we have to consider, maintenance of the metadata. So we started with the uh, syntactical metadata, which is if you consider a if you consider any document, it's going to be when was the document created, what kind of document it is, and author of the document, and things like that. That's the syntactic uh, annotation, that's syntactic metadata. So we've moved from that to semantics, which is giving us more information about the domain, which will help in intelligent information retrieval. Uh, let's consider the example of uh, an advert in, say, eBay or uh, Craigslist, a general post about a sale of a car that would generally have what? The model of a car, the make of the car, the year of the car, the price, etc. Now, if this kind of a post was annotated by all of this information, now syntactic uh, annotation or syntactic metadata in this case would be what? When was the post posted, right? The date of the post, etc. That would be syntactic. But what is actually going to help us is semantic annotations, things like all this make and model and year and everything. Now adding that kind of information to a post on a text list, can you imagine the kind of information we'd be able to retrieve for users and how useful that would be? So that's... Now I'll pass it to Sanjay. I have a question. Is it possible to uh, yeah. automate, like, say, the Craigslist idea since they have all that stuff in there? And it's kind of like year, like colon, year. I feel like that part you could, you know, extract from it. Is that possible, like, to automatically annotate stuff, or is that something that, like, humans can do? So annotating you have, so you're asking whether the annotation can be done automatically or not, right? Yeah. yeah that's so possible. yeah, so you have a lot of tools for that, mm -hmm. and so all the different approaches is what he's going to be talking about. Okay. So well, I'll ask you this question yeah. when you get up there. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have three different approaches. Uh, what do we do? Yeah, 
Do your talk first, maybe you answer my question. serves the same need to add annotations to uh, our web resources. 
So uh, there are three ways that we can uh, achieve this using automated tools or semi-automated approach or a manual approach. So uh, I'll, if I can uh, Digipedia Spotlight, which is a web, web service as an example. So Digipedia Spotlight is a tool which you can use to uh, annotate your web resources. It's a completely automated uh, tool if you use it uh, as a web service. So, uh, and if you want to use it uh, as a semi-automated tool, it also has a, a web front end where you can uh, go and paste your web source for the text you want to annotate. And what it will do, it will use uh, the linked open data, the, the data, data published in uh, linked open data cloud as a background knowledge to find what are the uh, entities present in, 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 in your data. And it will identify that. So you can, uh, you can claim that, uh, you can think of it as an automated uh, tool to, to annotate web pages. Even though it has a semi-automated uh, web interface, the rest service of that is other. And in semi-automated uh, uh, approaches, first the tool suggests us, uh, okay, these are the entities I found, and then uh, then comes the human involvement. Then a third person or a, 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 a human expertise goes and uh, check whether the annotations provided by the tool are correct. And if they are correct, uh, they accept the annotations and else rejects. In manual annotation uh, tools, Basically, the, uh, the humans do the annotation. Manually selects uh, whatever the text they, uh, you need to annotate and uh, add the annotations. There are tools uh, for that too. So uh, if you look at uh, Quido's annotator, it's semi-automated. Uh, it, it first uh, gives you a set of suggestions, and then it, it, uh, it, um, it, it expects a human uh, involvement too. Uh, human uh, expertise to come and have a look at the annotation. So, so uh, RVFP, uh, Resource Description Framework in Attributes, that's what the uh, acronym uh, means. It's a uh, W3C recommendation, as you can see in the slide. So, uh, uh, if you look at uh, RVFP, Example here. So you, uh, the the bold text you can see in the slide uh, are the annotations added using RPFP. So here we define the uh, the name space prefix as schema, and this is uh, in this, this this example we are using a, a vocabulary called schema or uh, which I'll uh, discuss in the next slide. So. Uh, in schema, you have a set of uh, vocabularies like uh, that discusses different uh, that that, uh, that describes different uh, entities or classes like persons, uh, books, uh, articles. So here I'm using uh, the person uh, type available in schema O, the person content type or, or the person vocabulary. So if I uh, Define uh, it uh, using the attribute type of using the RDFA attribute type of. Uh, it allows me to use different properties inside this person class or person vocabulary to annotate the content below it. So the uh, property name and property telephone comes from that uh, person vocabulary. URL2. And this schema you see here is the name, uh, name, namespace prefix uh, we use, uh, we define here. So uh, one major thing uh, in RDFA is that, uh, so the basic idea of annotation uh, for semantic pair is uh, going from the, the web of documents to web of data. So the main, uh, so if you look at this RDFA resource, uh, that uh, you 
using our leaf a resource element, you can define uh, or you can give an ID uh, to a section of your web page. So think this as a section of your web page. So uh, think you have uh, a web page that has uh, a list of names and phone numbers. And uh, uh, for this example, we we'll, uh, we'll think the URI, uh, we'll take the URI of that web page is uh, HTTP example.com slash people. So in my web page, I have a set of people, set of people names and their phone numbers. And I want to uh, address each and every name individually using an identifier. Using uh, the resource uh, at, uh, attribute in RDFA, I can do that. So uh, what that means, so if I have a set of uh, div text that describes uh, person information, and if, if I can uh, access uh, a particular div tag that describes a particular person using the uh, resource uh, attribute, that means I have uh, access to a, a certain data element of that web page. It's not the uh, so uh, as soon as you uh, use uh, RDFA resource uh, attribute, you can uh, you can access data elements in that web page. <coughs> so which uh, which is uh, which is very helpful uh, for the vision of web of data. Because now we do not, uh, I mean, if we go to example.com slash people, we, uh, we can access the, uh, the web page with uh, all set of names and phone numbers. But if we go to uh, example.com slash people, uh, for an example, say uh, ID John or hash John, hash Joe, you can uh, access this data element uh, uniquely. So, This attribute does that, so that's very important uh, for the uh, for the vision of web of data. When we are moving from uh, web of documents to web of data, or when we are moving uh, to the semantic web. And if we look at the other attributes, uh, RDFA about uh, basically uh, talks about uh, the subject of a triple. in different vocabularies. And uh, another uh, interesting uh, attribute you have here is the rev attribute, with, which describes the reverse relationship. For an example, think of, uh, so uh, in Sujan's presentation also, we had some examples about uh, owl sameness, which, which is the way that we express that uh, the two, two resources are the same. So in, in, in semantic web or in, in, our data, uh, in our data sets, if we, uh, if we have three different resources, and all, but uh, if, if, we, if we have uh, three, uh, for an example say, we have three different web, web pages, and all uh, three talks about the same, about, about a single person. So if we, if, uh, so if you look at that, uh, all three web pages talks about the same resource. If that particular web, uh, person has a web page, all three, uh, all three web pages talks about the same uh, person. So you and also you will find uh, it, it, there are links going from one resource to the other. 
saying that these two are uh, the same. The way we uh, express such relationships uh, is using Dao saying as construct. So, I can explain using This is uh, Barack Obama's uh, page in Wikipedia data set. So here, uh, there's a our same as link for you to uh, Freebase. Freebase is another data set. also see another entry saying our is our same as of Yago <coughs> presidency of Barack Obama. That means there's another data set called Yago which does not have an outgoing link a, 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 our same as outgoing link from Wikipedia to Yago but Yago has a reverse link to Wikipedia. Yago's Barack Obama's page has a link to DBPDS Barack Obama, which is a reverse link. So to, to, to model that, to model such complex relationships, we can use uh, 